Do you want to be safe and good, or do you want to take a chance and be great? Jimmy Johnson, coach who led the Dallas Cowboys football team to two consecutive Super Bowl championships in 1992 and 1993. High intention, low attachment. If you want to remain calm and peaceful as you go through life, you have to have high intention and low attachment. You do anything you can to create your desired outcomes, and then you let it go. Sometimes you don't get the intended result by the date that you want. That is life. You just keep moving in the direction of your goal until you get there. Sometimes the universe has other plans, and often they are better than the ones you had in mind. That is why I recommend adding the phrase, this or something better, to the end of your affirmations. When I was vacationing with my family on a cruise in Tahiti one summer, my son Christopher and my stepson Travis, both twelve at the time, and I set out on a guided bicycle tour around the island of Bora Bora with some other members from our cruise ship. My intention for the day was a bonding experience with my two sons. The wind was blowing really hard that day, and the trip was a difficult one. At one point, Stevie Eller, who was struggling along with her eleven-year-old grandson, took a nasty fall and badly cut her leg. Because there were only a few others in the back of the pack with us, we stayed behind to help her. There were no homes or stores, and virtually no traffic on the far side of the island, meaning that there was no way to call for help. So after attempting some crude first aid, we decided to all push on together. Bored with the slow pace, my boys took off ahead and I spent the next several hours pedaling and walking next to my new friend until we eventually reached a hotel where she called for a taxi, and I rejoined my sons, who had stopped for a swim. That night, Stevie and her husband, Carl, asked us to join their family for dinner. It turned out that they were on the nominating committee for the International Achievement Summit, sponsored by the Academy of Achievement. Its mission? to inspire youth with new dreams of achievement in a world of boundless opportunity by bringing together over 200 university and graduate student delegates from around the world to interact with contemporary leaders who have achieved the difficult or impossible in service to their fellow humans. After our time together, they decided to nominate me to become a member of the Academy and receive their Golden Plate Award joining previous recipients such as former President Bill Clinton, Placido Domingo, George Lucas, New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, U.S. Senator John McCain, former Prime Minister of Israel Shimon Peres, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Because my nomination was accepted, I was able to attend the annual four-day event with some of the brightest young future leaders and some of the most interesting and accomplished people in the world in 2004, and will be able to attend future meetings when I want to. Had I been totally attached to my original outcome of the day with my two sons and left Stevie to the care of others, I would have missed an even bigger opportunity that spontaneously came my way. I have learned over the years that whenever one door seemingly closes, another door opens. You just have to keep positive, stay aware, and look to see what it is. Instead of getting upset when things don't unfold as you anticipated, always remember to ask yourself the question, What's the possibility that this is? Principle 16 Be willing to pay the price. If people knew how hard I had to work to gain my mastery, it wouldn't seem wonderful at all. Michelangelo, Renaissance sculptor and painter who spent four years lying on his back painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Behind every great achievement is a story of education, training, practice, discipline, and sacrifice. You have to be willing to pay the price. Maybe that price is pursuing one single activity while putting everything else in your life on hold. Maybe it's investing all of your own personal wealth or savings. Maybe it's the willingness to walk away from the safety of your current situation. But though many things are typically required to reach a successful outcome, the willingness to do what's required adds that extra dimension to the mix 
that helps you persevere in the face of overwhelming challenges, setbacks, pain, and even personal injury. Pain is only temporary. The benefits last forever. I remember back to the 1976 Summer Olympic Games, when the men's gymnastic competition captured the attention of the world. With the roar of the crowd in the background, Japan's Shun Fujimoto landed a perfect triple somersault twist dismount from the rings to clinch the gold medal in team gymnastics. With his face contorted in pain and his teammates holding their breath, Fujimoto followed a near-flawless routine by achieving a stunning and perfect landing on a broken right knee. It was an extraordinary display of courage and commitment. Interviewed later about the win, Fujimoto revealed that even though he had injured his knee during the earlier floor exercise, it became apparent as the competition continued that the team gold medal would be decided by the ring's apparatus, his strongest result. The pain shot through me like a knife, he said. It brought tears to my eyes. But now I have a gold medal and the pain is gone. What was it that gave Fujimoto his extraordinary courage in the face of excruciating pain and the very real risk of serious injury. It was a willingness to pay the price, and probably a long history of paying the price every day, on the road to simply winning a spot to compete in the Olympics. Practice, practice, practice. When I played with Michael Jordan on the Olympic team, there was a huge gap between his ability and the ability of the other great players on that team. But what impressed me was that he was always the first one on the floor and the last one to leave. Steve Alford, Olympic gold medalist, NBA player, and head basketball coach at the University of Iowa. Before Bill Bradley became a U.S. Senator from New Jersey, he was an amazing basketball player. He was an All-American at Princeton University, won an Olympic gold medal in 1964, played in the NBA championships with the New York Knicks, and was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. How did he do so well at his sport? Well, for one thing, when he was in high school, he practiced for four hours a day, every day. In his memoir, Time Present, Time Past, Bradley offers the following account of his self-imposed basketball training regimen. I stayed behind to practice after my teammates had left. My practice routine was to end by making 15 baskets in a row from each of five spots on the floor. If he missed a shot, he would start over from the beginning. He continued this practice all through his college and professional career. He developed this strong commitment to practice when he attended summer basketball camps for high school players sponsored by the St. Louis Hawks' Easy Ed McCauley, where he learned the importance of practicing. When you're not practicing, someone somewhere is. And when the two of you meet, given roughly equal ability, he will win. Bill took that advice to heart. The hours of hard work paid off. Bill Bradley scored over 3,000 points in four years of high school basketball. Olympic Athletes Pay the Price I learned that the only way you're going to get anywhere in life is to work hard at it. Whether you're a musician, a writer, an athlete, or a businessman, there is no getting around it. If you do, you'll win. If you don't, you won't. Bruce Jenner, Olympic gold medalist in the decathlon. According to John Troop, writing in USA Today, The average Olympian trains four hours a day at least 310 days a year for six years before succeeding. Getting better begins with working out every day. By 7 a.m., most athletes have done more than many people do all day. Given equal talent, the better trained athlete can generally outperform the one who did not give a serious effort and is usually more confident at the starting block. The four years before an Olympics, Greg Louganis probably practiced each of his dives 3,000 times. Kim Semeskel, has probably done every flip in her gymnastics routine at least 20,000 times. And Janet Evans has completed more than 240,000 laps. Training works, but it isn't easy or simple. Swimmers train an average of 10 miles a day, 
at speeds of five miles per hour in the pool. That might not sound fast, but their heart rates average 160 the entire time. Try running up a flight of stairs, then check your heart rate. Then imagine having to do that for four hours. Marathon runners average 160 miles a week at 10 miles per hour. Consider the workout schedule of Michael Phelps, with 22 medals the most decorated Olympic athlete of all time. He was usually at the pool by 6.30 a.m., where he would swim for an average of six hours a day. That's around eight miles a day. He swam six days a week, including holidays. In addition to time in the pool, he lifted weights to add explosive speed to his regimen, spending an hour three days a week lifting weights, as well as an hour three days a week stretching his muscles. Although most of you reading this will never become Olympic athletes, nor do you want to, you can become world-class in whatever you do by putting in the disciplined effort to excel at your chosen trade, craft, or profession. To win at whatever game you choose to play, you need to be willing to pay the price. It's not the will to win that matters. Everyone has that. It's the will to prepare to win that matters. Paul Bear Bryant, college football's winningest coach, with 323 victories, including six national championships and 13 Southeastern Conference titles. Practice specific things consistently. Practice isn't the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing you do that makes you good. Malcolm Gladwell, author of Outliers, The Story of Success. While many athletes, musicians, dancers, comedians, and other gifted people practice their sports skills, dance variations, and other routines on a regular basis, Dr. Christine Carter, a sociologist at UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center, says elite performers differ in their approach to practice time. Not only do top performers practice more than people of average talent, but they spend hours upon hours in what she calls deliberate practice. Rather than merely plunking away at the keyboard because it is fun, they practice to reach specific objectives, such as to play a new piece that is just beyond their reach. In the beginning, Dr. Carter continues, they may also practice a new phrase or even a single measure again and again and again. While deliberate practice is rarely pleasurable, usually difficult, and quite often boring, an elite performer's willingness to practice in this goal-oriented way is what sets the world's best apart from people who are merely good at something. In other words, they don't just practice for fun. They practice specific things consistently over a long period of time. Consider this quote from Jeffrey Colvin, author of Talent is Overrated, What Really Separates World-Class Performers from Everybody Else. The reality that deliberate practice is hard can even be seen as good news. It means that most people won't do it, so your willingness to do it will distinguish you all the more. What's more, numerous studies now show this commitment to practicing toward a specific goal is what helps elite performers overcome a lack of innate talent or prevail over deficiencies in their physical body. Since consistent practice can actually help develop better physical characteristics, such as perfect pitch, more flexible joints, higher octaves, and other attributes. Legendary violinist Isaac Stern was once confronted by a middle-aged woman after a concert. She gushed, Oh, I'd give my life to play like you. Lady, said Stern acidly, that I did. Determined to be an artist at any cost. In the 1970s, Wylan was the classic starving artist who threw everything into his dream. He painted and he hustled. He would set up art shows at his local high school and sell original paintings for just $35, knowing that the only way he could develop as an artist was to sell his paintings for whatever he could get to earn enough money to buy the necessary supplies he needed to create more. Then one day, in what was to become a defining moment for the young artist, Wyland's mother told him, Art really isn't a job. It's a hobby. Now go out and get a real job. The next day, she dropped him off at the Detroit Unemployment Bureau. 
but to Wyland's dismay, he was fired from three different jobs three days in a row. He couldn't keep his mind on the boring factory work. He wanted to be creative and paint. A week later, he built the studio in the basement and worked day and night creating a portfolio that eventually won him a full scholarship to art school in Detroit. Wyland painted every moment he could, and he managed to sell some paintings, but for years he just managed to scrape by. But because he was determined that art was the only thing he wanted to do, he continued to work and hone his craft. One day, Wyland realized he had to go where other artists flourished and where new ideas were born. His destination was the well-known art colony of Laguna Beach, California, and with his dream fully alive, he moved into a cramped, tiny studio where he both worked and lived for several more years. Eventually, he was invited to participate in the annual art festival, where he learned to talk about his work and interact with collectors. Soon after, galleries in Hawaii discovered him, but often sold his paintings without ever paying him, claiming their overhead was high. Out of the frustration of finally selling high-priced paintings, only to have the money disappear, Wyland realized he had to own his own galleries. In his own galleries, he could control every aspect of selling his art, from how it was framed and hung to how it was sold and who it was sold by. Today, 36 years after opening his first gallery in Laguna Beach, he creates as many as 1,000 works of art a year, some of which sell for $200,000 apiece, creates artistic collaborations with the people at Disney, owns four homes in Hawaii, California, and Florida, and lives the life he always dreamed of. Perhaps you, like Wylan, want to turn your hobby into a career. You can become hugely successful doing what you love if you are willing to pay the price. In the beginning, you've got to kind of suffer, Wyland says, giving in to everybody else. But there's nothing better than eventually achieving success on your own terms. Willing to do whatever it takes Gordon Whiskey found his passion at an early age. When he was six years old, his parents took him to see his first movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Two hours later, he knew that what he wanted to do with his life was make movies. Growing up in Toronto, Canada, he made it through high school making short films with friends on outdated equipment. But they were enough to slap together a demo reel that got him accepted to a top film program at a Canadian university. He did well there until his third year when he made a decision that threatened to derail him on the way to his dream. With only three edit suites available for 150 students to edit their films on, he constantly found himself unable to book an edit suite. That's when he made the choice to take matters into his own hands and stole the security pass card from one of his professors so he could sneak in and work from midnight to 5 a.m. to finish his film. For the first week, everything went well. When week two rolled around, he invited two of his buddies to come in so they, too, could work on their film projects in the neighboring edit suites. But in the third week, having finished their film projects, they decided to celebrate in their secret haven with their girlfriends and booze. At the height of the party, the campus police busted in on them, and Gordon was expelled from the university. Gordon suddenly found himself with no degree and a pending trespassing charge. Still wanting to get into the film business, he gathered what little confidence he had left and went knocking at all the studio doors asking for a job, any job, even offering to work for free. He was met with the same old cliché. Don't call us, kid. We'll call you. Two weeks went by and his phone didn't ring once. And then it hit him. If I'm going to make it in this business, I'm going to have to stand out from all the rest and never take no for an answer. At the time, Toronto hadn't quite hit major studio status yet, and most production offices were dirty old steel mills converted into sound stages. It's hard to imagine now, but it was so bad that whenever it would rain, film production would grind to a halt due to the echoing sound of raindrops pelting down on the tin-plated rooftops. Knowing the grimy conditions, 
The second time when Gordon visited each rundown studio and production office that had rejected him, he went armed with a bottle of Windex and a roll of paper towels, and asked for permission to clean their toilets. Some laughed, as they weren't sure if he was serious or not, while others gladly said yes, following it with, But kid, I'm still not going to hire you. Gordon did this every day for a week, each day religiously cleaning the dirtiest of dirty production office toilets that had once been graced by steel workers. He encountered dirt on top of dirt. But Gordon worked until that porcelain shined. He also made sure to leave his phone number and name credit behind, because one thing he had learned about the film business is how important your name credit is. In fact, on the back of every stall door, he attached the following sign to his film resume. Washroom cleaned by Gordon. Looking to get my foot in the world of film. Will work for food. Even though his film resume and experience on paper was slim, he made sure his work spoke for him with the cleanest toilets in town. Think about it. What a perfect place to hang your resume and get someone's undivided attention while they're sitting on the toilet with nothing else to do but read what's hanging in front of them. At the time, and unknown to Gordon, there was a team of Los Angeles producers scouting Toronto to see if the city was a suitable match for Boston, the setting for a film they were looking to shoot. It turned out that, in every production office they visited, they noticed a resume inside the toilet stall. It actually became a game of theirs to look into each production office facility to see if Gordon's resume was hanging there. One night, Gordon's phone rang, and he was hired by the Los Angeles producers for two weeks, happily working for food and gas money as he ran errands for them. When the two weeks were up, they called him into their hotel room and shared the good news. The movie had just been given the green light and was going to be called Goodwill Hunting. Even better news. The producers made Gordon the personal assistant to Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, who at the time were relatively unknown actors, but were about to become superstars. Because of his willingness to pay the price and do whatever it took, within a month of being expelled from film school and having his dreams crushed, he ended up working on an Academy Award-winning film that changed his life. After the success of Goodwill Hunting, Gordon went on to work on a long list of Hollywood blockbuster films for some of the industry's biggest names, including Steve Martin, Hugh Jackman, John Travolta, Charlize Theron, Gene Hackman, Michelle Pfeiffer, Helen Mirren, Forrest Whitaker, and Morgan Freeman. In 2011, Gordon was asked to join the DreamWorks development team working alongside his personal hero, Steven Spielberg, the director of Close Encounters of the Third Kind the movie that had originally inspired Gordon's dream. Today, Gordon is the president of Canwood Entertainment, a global entertainment company headquartered in Toronto, Canada. And the sweetest part of the story? Not only has Gordon been invited many times to speak to the graduating class of the university that expelled him, they dismissed all trespassing charges. Putting in the time the big secret in life is that there is no secret. Whatever is your goal, you can get there if you're willing to work. Oprah Winfrey Talk show host, actress, producer, author, and philanthropist Part of paying the price is the willingness to do whatever it takes to get the job done, no matter what it takes, no matter how long it takes, no matter what comes up. It's a done deal. You are responsible for the results you intend. No excuses. Just a world-class performance or an outstanding result that can be counted on. Consider this. Ernest Hemingway rewrote A Farewell to Arms 39 times. This dedication to excellence would later lead him to win the Pulitzer and Nobel Prizes for Literature. M. Scott Peck received only a $7,500 advance for the road less traveled. However, he was willing to pay the price to fulfill his dream. During the first year after it was published, he participated in 1,000 radio interviews to advertise and promote his book. He continued to do a minimum of one interview a day for the next 13 years, 
keeping the book on the New York Times bestsellers list for over 694 weeks, or more than 13 years, a record, and selling more than 10 million copies in over 20 languages. Michael Crichton created the Emmy Award-winning television series E.R. His books have sold over 200 million copies in 30 languages, and 14 have been made into films, seven of which he directed. His books and films include Jurassic Park, The Andromeda Strain, Congo, Twister, and Westworld. He is the only person to have had, at the same time, the number one book, the number one movie, and the number one television show in the United States. With all of his natural talent, Michael said, Books aren't written. They're rewritten. It's one of the hardest things to accept, especially after the seventh rewrite hasn't quite done it. Talent is cheaper than table salt. What separates the talented individual from the successful one is a lot of hard work. Stephen King, best-selling author, with over 50 books in print, many of which have been made into movies, such as Carrie, Cujo, and The Green Mile. It's about building momentum. When a NASA rocket takes off from Cape Canaveral, it uses up a large portion of its total fuel just to overcome the gravitational pull of the Earth. Once it has achieved that, it can virtually coast through space for the rest of its journey. Likewise, an amateur athlete often puts in full training days with Spartan self-discipline for years. But after winning a gold medal or a world championship, offers for endorsements, spokesperson contracts, speaking engagements, retail merchandise deals, and other entrepreneurial opportunities often come pouring in, allowing them to slow down a bit and take advantage of the momentum they created earlier in their career. Likewise, in any business or profession, once you have paid the price to establish yourself as an expert, a person of integrity who delivers high-quality results on time, you get to reap the benefits of that for the rest of your life. When I started speaking, no one had ever heard of me. As I delivered more and more speeches and seminars that delivered what the client wanted, my reputation grew. I had a file full of glowing testimonial letters and a track record of credibility that was built up over many years of giving free and low-fee talks until I had honed my craft. The same was true for writing books. It took many years to get good at it. If you are involved in network marketing, you have to put in countless hours in the beginning, not getting paid what you are worth. You may work for months with no real income, but eventually the multiplier effect of your growing downline takes effect, and eventually you are making more money than you ever imagined possible. Creating momentum is an important part of the success process. In fact, successful people know that if you're willing to pay the price in the beginning, you can reap the benefits for the rest of your life. Going Through the Awkward Stage Business consultant Marshall Thurber has said, Anything worth doing well is worth doing badly in the beginning. Remember when you first learned to drive a car, to ride a bicycle, to play an instrument, or to play a sport? You understood in advance that you were going to be very awkward at first. You assumed that awkwardness was just part of what was required to learn that new skill that you wanted. Well, not surprisingly, this initial awkwardness applies to anything you undertake, so you have to be willing to go through that awkward stage in order to become proficient. Children give themselves permission to do this, but sadly, by the time we're adults, we are so often afraid of making a mistake that we don't let ourselves be awkward, so we don't learn the way children do. We're so afraid of doing it wrong. I didn't learn to ski until I was in my forties. In the beginning, I was definitely not good at it. Over time, with lessons, I got better. Even the first time I kissed a girl, it was awkward. But to gain a skill or get better at anything you want to do, you have to be willing to keep on going in the face of looking foolish and feeling stupid for a time. Find out the price you have to pay. Of course, if you don't know what the price is, you can't choose to pay it. 
Sometimes the first step is to investigate the steps that will be required to achieve your desired goal. For example, many people, perhaps you, say they want to own a yacht. But have you ever researched how much money you would have to earn to buy one? Or how much it costs to harbor the yacht in your local marina? Or how much the monthly maintenance, fuel, insurance, and license cost? You may need to research what costs others have had to pay to achieve dreams similar to yours. You might want to make a list of several people who have already done what you want to do and interview them about what sacrifices they had to make along the way. You may discover that some costs are more than you want to pay. You may not want to risk your health, your relationships, or your entire life savings for a certain goal. You have to weigh all of the factors. That dream job may not be worth your marriage, your kids, or a lack of balance in your life. Only you can decide what is right for you and what price you are willing to pay. It may be that what you want doesn't serve you in the long run, but if it does, find out what you need to do and then set about doing it. Principle 17. Ask, ask, ask. You've got to ask. Asking is, in my opinion, the world's most powerful and neglected secret to success and happiness. Percy Ross, self-made multimillionaire and philanthropist. History is filled with examples of incredible riches and astounding benefits people have received simply by asking for them. Yet surprisingly, asking, one of the most powerful success principles of all, is still a challenge that holds most people back. If you are not afraid to ask anybody for anything, then skip over this chapter. But if you are like most people, you may be holding yourself back by not asking for the information, assistance, support, money, and time that you need to fulfill your vision and make your dreams come true. Why People Are Afraid to Ask Why are people so afraid to ask? They are afraid of many things, such as looking needy, looking foolish, and looking stupid. But mostly they're afraid of experiencing rejection. They're afraid of hearing the word no. The sad thing is that they're actually rejecting themselves in advance. They're saying no to themselves before anyone else even has a chance to. When I was a graduate student at the School of Education at the University of Chicago, I participated in a self-development group with 20 other people. During one of the exercises, one of the men asked one of the women if she found him attractive. I was both shocked by the boldness of the question and embarrassed for the asker, fearing what he might get as a response. As it turned out, she said that she did. Emboldened by his success, I then asked her if she found me attractive. After this little exercise in bold asking, several of the women told us that they found it unbelievable how scared men were when it came to asking women for a date. She said, You reject yourself before you even give us a chance to. Take the risk. We might say yes. Don't assume that you are going to get a no. Take the risk to ask for whatever you need and want. If they say no, you are no worse off than when you started. If they say yes, you are a lot better off. Just by being willing to ask, you can get a raise, a donation, a room with an ocean view, a discount, a free sample, a date, a better assignment, a more convenient delivery date, an extension, time off, or help with the housework. How You Ask for What You Want there's a specific science to asking for and getting what you want or need in life, and Mark Victor Hansen and I have written a whole book about it. And though I recommend you learn more by reading our book, The Aladdin Factor, here are some quick tips to get you started. 1. Ask as if you expect to get it. Ask with a positive expectation. Ask from the place that you have already been given it. It's a done deal. Ask as if you expect to get a yes. 2. Assume you can. Don't start with the assumption that you can't get it. 
If you're going to assume anything, assume you can get an upgrade. Assume you can get a table by the window. Assume that you can return it without a sales slip. Assume that you can get a scholarship, that you can get a raise, that you can get tickets at this late date. Don't ever assume against yourself. 3. Ask someone who can give it to you. Qualify the person. Who would I have to speak to to get? Who is authorized to make a decision about? What would have to happen for me to get? 4. Be clear and specific. In my seminars, I often ask, Who wants more money? I pick someone who raises a hand, and I give that person a dollar. I say, You now have more money. Are you satisfied? The person usually says, No, I want more than that. So I give the person a couple of quarters and ask, Is that enough for you? No, I want more than that. Well, just how much do you want? We could play this game of more for days and never get to what you want. The person usually gives me a specific number, and then I point out how important it is to be specific. Vague requests produce vague results. Your requests need to be specific. When it comes to money, you need to ask for a specific amount. Don't say, I want a raise. Do say, I want a raise of $500 a month. When it comes to when you want something done, don't say soon or whenever it's convenient. Give a specific date and time. Don't say, I want to spend some time with you this weekend. Do say, I would like to go out for dinner and a movie with you on Saturday night. Would that work for you? When it comes to a behavioral request, be specific. Say exactly what you want the person to do. Don't say, I want more help around the house. Do say, I want you to wash the dishes every night after dinner and take out the garbage Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights. 5. Ask repeatedly. One of the most important principles of success is persistence, not giving up. Whenever you're asking others to participate in the fulfillment of your goals, some people are going to say no. They may have other priorities, commitments, and reasons not to participate. It's not a reflection on you. Just get used to the idea that there's going to be a lot of rejection along the way to your goal. The key is not to give up. When someone says no, you keep on asking. Why? Because when you keep on asking, even the same person, again and again, you might get a yes on a different day, when the person is in a better mood, when you have new data to present, after you've proven your commitment to them, when circumstances have changed, when you've learned how to close better, when the person trusts you more, when you have paid your dues, when the economy is better. Kids understand this success principle perhaps better than anyone. They will ask the same person for the same thing over and over again without any hesitation. They eventually wear you down. I once read a story in People magazine about a man who asked the same woman more than 30 times to marry him. No matter how many times she said no, he kept coming back. And eventually she said yes. A Telling Statistic Herbert True a marketing specialist at Notre Dame University found that 44% of all salespeople quit trying to sell to a prospect after the first call. 24% quit after the second call. 14% quit after the third call. 12% quit trying to sell their prospect after the fourth call. This means that 94% of all salespeople quit by the fourth call but 60% of all sales are made after the fourth call. This revealing statistic shows that 94% of all salespeople don't give themselves a chance at 60% of the prospective buyers. You may have the capacity, but you also have to have the tenacity. To be successful, you have to ask, 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 ask. As one of my students recently joked, you have to become an Ask hole. Ask 
and it shall be given to you. A few years ago, Sylvia Collins flew all the way from Australia to Santa Barbara to take one of my week-long seminars, where she learned about the power of asking. A year later, I received this letter from her. I'm selling real estate developments on the Gold Coast and work with a team of guys mostly in their twenties. The skills I've acquired through your seminars have helped me perform to be an active part of a winning team. I must tell you how having self-esteem and not being afraid to ask has impacted this office. At a recent staff meeting, we were asked what we would like to do for our once-a-month team-building day. I asked Michael, the managing director, what target would we have to reach for you to take us to an island for a week? Everyone went silent and looked at me. Obviously, it was out of everyone's comfort zone to ask such a thing. Michael looked around and then looked at me and said, Well, if you reach... And then he set a financial target. I'll take the whole team, ten of us, to the Great Barrier Reef. Well, the next month we reached the target, and off we went to Lady Elliot Island for four days. Airfare, accommodations, food, and activities all paid by the company. We snorkeled together, had bonfires on the beach, played tricks on each other, and had so much fun. Afterwards, Michael gave us another target and said he would take us to Fiji if we reached it. And we reached that target in December. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain by asking. To be successful, you have to take risks. And one of the risks is the willingness to risk rejection. Here's an email I received from Donna Hutcherson, who heard me speak at her company's convention in Scottsdale, Arizona. My husband Dale and I heard you at the Walsworth Convention in early January. Dale came as one of the spouses. He was particularly impressed by your mention of not having anything to lose by asking or trying. After hearing you speak, he decided to go for one of his lifetime goals and heart's desire, a head football coaching position. He applied for four openings within my sales territory, and Sebring High School called him back the next day, encouraging him to fill out the application online. He did so right away and could hardly sleep that night. After two interviews, he was chosen over 61 other applicants. Today, Dale accepted the position as head football coach at Sebring High School in Sebring, Florida. Thank you for your vision and inspiration. A year later, I heard from Donna again. Having taken over a program with back-to-back -back seasons of one win, nine losses, and a reputation for giving up, Dale led the Sebring High School team to a winning record, including four games where the team came from behind to win in the final three minutes of the game. Not only that, but Dale also coached the team to a county championship and the playoffs for only the third time in the 78-year history of the school. He was named County Coach of the Year and Sports Story of the Year. Most important, though, is that he changed the lives of the many players, staff, and students with whom he worked. Will you give me some money? In 1997, 21-year-old Chad Pogracki set out on a one-man mission to clean up the Mississippi River. He started with a 20-foot boat and his own two hands. When Chad realized he would need more than his 20-foot boat, barges, trucks, and equipment, he asked state and local officials for help, only to be turned down. Not to be dissuaded, Chad grabbed a phone book, turned to the business listings, and called Alcoa. Because, he said, it started with an A. Armed with only his passionate commitment to his dream, Chad asked to speak to the top guy. Eventually, Alcoa gave him $8,400. Later, working his way through the A's, he called Anheuser-Busch. As reported in Smithsonian Magazine, Mary Alice Ramirez, the director of environmental outreach at Anheuser-Busch, remembers her first conversation with Chad this way. Will you give me some money? Chad asked. Who are you? replied Ramirez. I want to get rid of the garbage in the Mississippi River, Chad said. Can you show me a proposal? Ramirez inquired. What's a proposal? 
Chad replied. Ramirez eventually invited Chad to a meeting and gave him a check for $25,000 to expand his Mississippi River beautification and restoration project. More important than Chad's knowledge of fundraising was his clear desire to make a difference, his unflagging enthusiasm, his complete dedication to the project, and his willingness to ask. Eventually, everything Chad needed was secured through asking. He now has a board of directors made up of lawyers, accountants, and corporate officers. He has 12 full-time staff members and tens of thousands of volunteers and has raised millions of dollars in donations to support the work. In the process, he has cleaned up thousands of miles of shoreline on the Mississippi and 22 other rivers, removing over 7 million pounds of trash. But he's also drawn attention to the health and beauty of all rivers and the responsibility we all share in keeping them clean. For more information on the Mississippi River Beautification and Restoration Project, or how to participate in Adopt a Mississippi River Mile, visit www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. And in 2013, he was named CNN Hero of the Year. Start asking today. Take time now to make a list of the things that you want that you don't ask for at home, school, or work. Next to each one, write down how you stop yourself from asking. What is your fear? Next, write down what it is costing you not to ask. Then write down what benefit you would get if you were to ask. Take time to make a list of what you need to ask for in each of the following seven goal categories that I outlined in Principle 3. Decide what you want. Financial job and career. Fun time and recreation, health and fitness, relationships, personal projects and hobbies, and contribution to the larger community. Do you need to ask for a raise, a loan, seed money, venture capital, feedback about your performance, a referral, an endorsement, time off to get additional training, someone to babysit your children, a massage, a hug, or help with a volunteer project? Principle 18. Reject Rejection. We keep going back, stronger, not weaker, because we will not allow rejection to beat us down. It will only strengthen our resolve. To be successful, there is no other way. Earl G. Graves, founder and publisher of Black Enterprise magazine. If you are going to be successful, you're going to need to learn how to deal with rejection. Rejection is a natural part of life. You get rejected when you aren't picked for the team, don't get the part in the play, don't get elected, don't get into the college or graduate school of your choice, don't get the job or promotion you wanted, don't get the sale, don't get the raise you wanted, don't get the appointment you requested, don't get the date you asked for, don't get the permission you requested, or you get fired. You get rejected when your manuscript is rejected, your proposal is turned down, your new product idea is passed over, your fundraising request is ignored, your design concept is not accepted, your application for membership is denied, or your offer of marriage is not accepted. Rejection is a myth. To get over rejection, you have to realize that rejection is really a myth. It doesn't really exist. It is simply a concept that you hold in your head. Think about it. If you ask Patty to have dinner with you and she says no, you didn't have anyone to eat dinner with before you asked her, and you don't have anyone to eat dinner with after you asked her. The situation didn't get worse, it stayed the same. It only gets worse if you go inside and tell yourself something extra like, See, mother was right. No one will ever like me. I am the slug of the universe. If you apply to Harvard for graduate school and you don't get in, you weren't in Harvard before you applied, and you are not in Harvard after you applied. Again, your life didn't get worse. It stayed the same. 
you haven't really lost anything. And think about this. You have spent your whole life not going to Harvard. You know how to handle that. The truth is, you never have anything to lose by asking. And because there is something to possibly gain, by all means, ask. SW, 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 SW. Whenever you ask anyone for anything, remember the following. SW, 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 SW. Which stands for, some will, some won't. So what? Someone's waiting. Some people are going to say yes, and some are going to say no. So what? Out there somewhere, someone is waiting for you and your ideas. It is simply a numbers game. You have to keep asking until you get a yes. The yes is out there waiting. As my partner, Mark Victor Hansen, is so fond of saying, What you want, wants you. You just have to hang in there long enough to eventually get a yes. 81 knows, 9 straight yeses. Because the program had so dramatically changed her life, a graduate of my self-esteem and peak performance seminar was volunteering in the evenings to call people to enroll them in an upcoming seminar I was conducting in St. Louis. She made a commitment to talk to three people every night for a month. Many of the calls turned into long conversations, with people asking tons of questions. She made a total of 90 phone calls. The first 81 people decided not to take the seminar. The next nine people all signed up. She had a 10% success ratio, which is a good ratio for phone enrollments. But all nine enrollments came in the last nine calls. What if she had given up after the first 50 people and said, this just isn't working. It's not worth the effort. Nobody is signing up. But because she had a dream of sharing with others the life-transforming experience that she had had, she persevered in the face of a lot of rejection, knowing that it was indeed a numbers game. And her commitment to the outcome paid off. She was instrumental in helping nine people transform their lives. If you're committed to a cause that evokes your passion and commitment, you keep learning from your experiences, and you stay the course to the end. You will eventually create your desired outcome. Never give up on your dream. Perseverance is all important. If you don't have the desire and the belief in yourself to keep trying after you've been told you should quit, you'll never make it. Tawny O'Dell, author of Backroads, an Oprah book club pick. Just say, next. Get used to the idea that there is going to be a lot of rejection along the way to your goals. The secret to success is to not give up. When someone says no, you say, next? Keep on asking. When Colonel Harlan Sanders left home with his pressure cooker and his special recipe for cooking southern fried chicken, he received 1,009 rejections before he found someone to believe in his dream. Because he rejected rejection over 1,000 times, there are now 18,875 KFC outlets in 118 countries and territories around the world. If one person tells you no, ask someone else. Remember, there are over 5 billion people on the planet. Someone, somewhere, sometime will say yes. Don't get stuck in your fear or resentment. Move on to the next person. It's a numbers game. Someone is waiting to say yes. Chicken Soup for the Soul Success consists of going from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Winston Churchill, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom In the fall of 1991, Mark Victor Hansen and I began the process of selling our first Chicken Soup for the Soul book to a publisher. We flew to New York with Jeff Herman, our literary agent at the time, and met with every major publisher that would grant us a meeting. All of them said they weren't interested. Collections of short stories don't sell. There's no edge to the stories. The title will never work. After that, we were rejected by another 20 publishers who had received the manuscript through the mail. After being rejected by more than 30 publishers, our agent gave the book back to us and said, 
I'm sorry, I can't sell it for you. What did we do? We said, next. We also knew we had to think outside of the box. After weeks of racking our brains, we hit on an idea that we thought would work. We printed up a form that was a promise to buy the book when it was published. It included a place for people to write their name, address, and the number of books they pledged to buy. Over a period of months, we asked everyone who attended our speeches or seminars to complete the form if they would buy a copy of the book when it was published. Eventually, we had promises to buy 20,000 books. The following spring, Mark and I attended the American Booksellers Association convention in Anaheim, California, and walked from booth to booth, talking to any publisher who would listen. Even with copies of our signed pledge forms to demonstrate the market for our book, we were turned down again and again. But again and again, we said, Next! At the end of the second very long day, we gave a copy of the first thirty stories in the book to Peter Vegso and Gary Seidler, co-presidents of Health Communications, Inc., a struggling publisher specializing in addiction and recovery books, who agreed to take it home and look it over. Later that week, Gary Seidler took the manuscript to the beach and read it. He loved it and decided to give us a chance. Those hundreds of nexts had paid off. After more than 140 rejections, that first book went on to sell 10 million copies, spawning a series of 250 best-selling books that have been translated into 43 languages with worldwide sales of 500 million books. And those pledge forms? When the book was finally published, we stapled an announcement to the signed forms, sent them to the person at the address on the form, and waited for a check. Almost everyone who had promised to buy a book came through on his or her commitment. In fact, one entrepreneur in Canada bought 1,700 copies and gave one to every one of his clients. This manuscript of yours that has just come back from another editor is a precious package. Don't consider it rejected. Consider that you've addressed it to the editor who can appreciate my work, and it has simply come back stamped, not at this address. Just keep looking for the right address. Barbara Kingsolver, best-selling author of The Poisonwood Bible. 155 Rejections Didn't Stop Him When 19-year-old Rick Little wanted to start a program in high schools that would teach kids how to deal with their feelings, handle conflict, clarify their life goals, and learn communication skills and values that would help them live more effective and fulfilling lives. He wrote a proposal and shopped it to over 155 foundations. He slept in the back of his car and ate peanut butter on crackers for the better part of a year. But he never gave up his dream. Eventually, the Kellogg Foundation gave Rick $130,000. That's almost $1,000 for each no he endured. Since that time, Rick and his team have raised over $100 million to implement the Quest program in 36 languages and more than 30,000 schools in 80 countries around the world. Three million kids per year are being taught important life skills because one 19-year-old rejected rejection and kept on going until he got a yes. In 1989, Rick received a grant for $65 million, the second largest grant ever given in U.S. history, to create the International Youth Foundation. What if Rick had given up after the 100th rejection and said to himself, Well, I guess this just isn't supposed to be. What a great loss to the world and to Rick's higher purpose for being. He knocked on 12,500 doors. I take rejection as someone blowing a bugle in my ear to wake me up and get going, rather than retreat. Sylvester Stallone, actor, writer, and director. When Dr. Ignatius Piazza was a young chiropractor fresh out of school, he decided he wanted to set up offices in the Monterey Bay area of California. When he approached the local chiropractic association for assistance, 
they advised him to set up shop somewhere else. They told him he wouldn't be successful because there were already too many chiropractors in the area. Undaunted, he applied the next principle. For months, he went from door to door early in the morning until sunset, knocking on doors. After introducing himself as the new young doctor in town, he asked a few questions. Where should I locate my office? What newspaper should I advertise in to reach your neighbors? Should I open early in the morning or stay open into the evening for those who have nine-to-five jobs? Should I call my clinic Chiropractic West or Ignatius Piazza Chiropractic? And finally, he asked, When I hold my open house, would you like to receive an invitation? If people said yes, he wrote down their names and addresses and continued on, day after day, month after month. By the time he was done, he had knocked on over 12,500 doors and talked to over 6,500 people. He got a lot of no's. He got a lot of nobody homes. He even got trapped on one porch, cornered by a pit bull, for a whole afternoon. But he also received enough yeses that during his first month in practice he saw 233 new patients and earned a record income of $72,000 in an area that didn't need another chiropractor. Remember, to get what you want, you're going to need to ask, 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 and say, next, 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 until you get the yes or yeses you're looking for. Asking is, was, and always will be a numbers game. Don't take it personally, because it isn't personal.